The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hi there, and welcome from Studio 27 in Sacramento, California, and from our other panelists in New Jersey and Pennsylvania to today's webinar, Cost-Effective Compliance Strategies, Separating the Contenders from the Pretenders in the World of Oil Water Separation, sponsored by Mercer International, a global innovator in providing high-performance coalescer separators and hosted by WebAttract, your end-to-end -end solution provider for informational webinars. Hi, I'm Mike Agron. I'm the executive webinar producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your hosts and moderator for today's session. In just a moment, I'm going to be introducing our featured speakers as today's webinar is hearing from these experts as they discuss today's topic. But to get started, Let's talk a little bit about who's here. First off, we're thrilled to have a global audience. We've got folks from over 15 countries, 32 states and provinces that represent the following industries. So you probably see yourself in one of those industries. But we've invited you, along with other professionals and executives, and as I mentioned just a few moments ago, is to hear from these two experts around the topic of cost-effective compliance strategies and really based on what's going on in the industry today regarding some of the key trends, challenges, and opportunities. And what you're going to hear are some highlights from real-life client examples on three basic things. The first one is, what do you need to know about how you can prevent your company from incurring citations and fines? Two, how you can increase the time between maintenance, cleaning schedules, and still produce satisfactory, affluent, and finally, how you can save your company money in regard to your separator equipment. And what our goal is, is to provide you with the above information and review the five mainstream options that are available on the market today, including the true cost of ownership as it relates to the overall life cycle of oil water separation and certain critical issues that are overlooked when selecting, selecting an oil water separator. And to support this goal, you'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Experts panel session with both the panelists. Now, regardless of your industry, location, or role, we're absolutely certain and confident that you'll get value out of today's webinar. And let's get started with our first poll. I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. And what I'd like you to do is help us better understand, of the following, which are your most pressing operational challenges. Is it separators meeting affluent criteria? Is it maintenance cost and frequency? Is it aging equipment? Is it flow capacity of the separator being too low? Or is it suspended solids creating following issues? And let's share the results. Okay. Well, it looks like um, separators meeting affluent criteria is 55%. Uh, Forty percent say maintenance cost and frequency is a challenge. Twenty-three percent on aging equipment. Uh, Twenty-three percent on flow capacity of the separator being too low. And thirty-three percent suspended solids creating following issues. Very interesting. Well, let's get on with the program. And uh, to do that, I want to introduce who our thought leader panel is going to be today. We've got Dave Golding, or Gotting, I should say founder of Mercer International, and that's a company that markets and designs a full line of high-performance oil water separators for industry, and Philip D'Angelo, who you see over there on the right, of Jodan Technologies. And Jodan is a technology consulting firm, and what Phil does is he provides process chemistry and water treatment uh, consulting services to electric utilities as well as commercial and industrial clients in the U.S. and around the world. Now, both of these gentlemen are true experts on today's topic. They each have over 25 years' experience, and we're absolutely delighted to have them. So we're going to start first with Phil, who's going to speak on some of the industry trends, and he's going to do this to create a framework for what you need to know about the technologies available to help you solve today's challenges so you can stay compliant longer and save money. And there's a, a lot of evaluation and historical detail to understand. So Phil's going to start with an overview, and then he'll be followed by Dave, who's going to come with some more specific examples. And his discussion on the unique design benefits will be a lot easier to understand once Phil sets the stage. And Phil, as he goes through his talk, will conclude with the results of a recent case study on manhole wastewater treatment. 
So now it's my pleasure to call up to the virtual podium, Phil D'Angelo, and welcome to the webinar. And Phil, how are you doing today? Very good, Mike. Thank you. Well, delighted to have you. Just curious before we jump into your portion, any comments on the poll that we just had uh, as far as what folks uh, consider their biggest challenges? Yeah, just in looking at it, it's uh, it's fairly it's interesting and it's fairly typical of what we see in the field. Compliance really is the the big issue. Well, great. I'll turn it over okay. to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be asked by Mercer International to share my field experience and uh, in, oil, in oil water separation. What I'm going to do is is go through and uh, provide some information of what what we actually see happening in the field for the API separators essentially for six technologies, for the CPIs, for vertical tubes, for below ground separators and secondary mesh packs. And then I'm going to get into um, a case study that incorporates oil water separation into a uh, complete treatment process. The, uh, the reason we're all here is because of the, of the Clean Water Act uh, in the early 1970s. This was the environmental regulatory discharge uh, requirements uh, were set for oil water discharges as well as everything else. And uh, were put in place and uh, put limits in place, and essentially have been ratcheting down those limits ever since the, uh, the early 70s. So it's one of the reasons why the technologies have had to try to keep up uh, with, the, uh, with the new uh, requirements. The first thing that we're going to look at is the API separator, which most of you are probably familiar with. The separator actually dates back to about 1933, when the uh, American Petroleum Institute established the design parameters for oil separation at various flow rates. If anybody's interested in it, the API has a ton of manuals and on, uh, on how these things work and all the calculations go along with them, and you can find them uh, on their website. In theory, the API separator is designed around Stokes Law that defines the rise velocity of oil droplets based on their density and size, which is a function of the specific gravity differences between the oil suspended solids and the wastewater. The idea is to size the API separator so that the oil droplets in the bottom area of the inlet of the tank will have enough retention time and rise velocity to reach the surface before the horizontal flow velocity of the wastewater carries it out of the, out of the separator. This is a rise over run issue. Um, there's a, lots of advantages to the API. Uh, separators, their uh, simplicity of design, ease of operation, and resistance to plugging with solids. The reality is that that what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the oil droplets removed that are larger than 150 microns. And uh, anything that's uh, less than 150 microns will be staying within a system if it's an API. Unfortunately, being able to get down to 150 mic microns uh, causes some problems with compliance today because now you're trying to essentially uh, reach 10 to 15 ppm of oil and grease or lower depending on where you are and 150 micron oil droplet particle just just won't make it. This problem is made worse if high shear pumps, especially centrifugal pumps, are used to pump the wastewater into the API. Some of these APIs are underground, some of them are above ground. The ones that are above ground have to be pumped up and into. I oftentimes see centrifugal pumps being used and we always recommend either progressive cavity pumps or air diaphragm pumps which won't shear the, uh, which won't shear the, shear the oil. Uh, anything that increases the percentage of sub 150 micron oil particles will significantly impact the separator's efficiency. And that's the reason that new technologies came about as a, after the API was put in place. The first one to come up, the first design to compensate for the API inefficiencies was really the flat parallel plate coalescer. The flat plate coalescer became more commonplace in refinery applications in and around the 60s to help a API units become more efficient in removal of oils and solids. Initially, these inclined plate uh, coalescers with wide open plate gaps worked very well because the parallel plate bundles could be retrofitted into existing API larger units and or supplied uh, in a smaller footprint as a standalone unit. Uh, the way they work is that the stacked flat parallel plates increase the surface area and allowed the oils and solids to travel shorter vertical distances before being pulled out of the horizontal flow, which results in increased separation efficiency. The benefits of flat plate uh, units were smaller in, was that they were smaller than the API units, 
and uh, and they also reduced the particle size from 150 down to less than 100 microns. When I say smaller than, they were about five times smaller than. So this was a significant improvement uh, considering the size of the of the APIs. We need to understand that as the environmental laws became more stringent, these coalescer packs uh, needed more surface area. And this was accomplished by the flat plate units being built with tighter and tighter plate gaps, which eventually resulted in premature fouling with particulates. The picture to the left is a downflow design, meaning water and solids move down, and the oil has to move upflow in a countercurrent flow direction. Eventually, as the plate gaps reach one inch, the downflow designs were replaced with a crossflow design, which allowed the solids, oil, and water to move in essentially the same direction and eliminated the counterflow. Eventually, these flat plate parallel uh, coalescers evolved in the corrugated plate units, which increased surface area and saved material cost. The corrugated plates were initially manufactured of, uh, of corrugated steel, uh, fiberglass, and, and eventually plastic. Essentially, uh, separator designers found that they could increase surface area, reduce materials and fabrication costs, and provide uh, what they consider to be a better uh, structural integrity. The problem with these units is that the solids build up in the troughs. They reduce the surface area and foul the plate gaps. The buildup of solids eventually turns to sludge, and there is no way for the solids to be efficiently processed out of the packs. Once you fill the troughs, the solids uh, get in the way of the rising oil. Once this happens, you get this trough effect, which reduces usable plate surface area, which causes internal sagging, especially if you're dealing with plastic materials, and eventually breakage of the plastic materials. The metal plates survived much better than, the, than these plastic plates did. And we see this in the field all the time, where the plastic plates are bunched up and, and broken. Uh, these things also foul more easily, and they need to be cleaned out more often, uh, which is not an easy task. It moved from the corrugated plates to what, we, what I'm calling the honeycomb, which are plastic corrugated packs. Uh, this type of coalescer is composed of irregularly shaped plastic plates set vertical or otherwise, and they're thermally welded or they're glued together uh, to form plate bundles with torturous flow paths. Uh, to put it simple, the problem is that these plastic units easily clog with solids and are a nuisance to clean, especially in industries like the electric utility industry, which I'm very familiar with, where they are operating with minimum manpower. Uh, it needs to be reiterated that Stokes Law is only effective with flows having a low Reynolds number, and that is laminar flow. That's a must. Even though turbulent flow is a major issue within this design, within this pack design, the plugging of the honeycomb design still remains the single biggest reason for failing to meet the efficiencies required for compliance. It's that plugging issue that's driving a lot of the compliance issues. Even if the solids are able to find their way uh, around the various nooks and crannies, they simply have no place to go when they reach the edge of the bundle. Uh, the solids tend to dead end, where two bundles contact each other. The larger the unit, the more bundles, uh, the more points of contact, and the worse the problem. This is seen, uh, we see this all the time in the field. As you saw in, in the previous picture, the honeycomb simply cannot process solids and therefore acts like a filter catching solids, rather than as a true co coalescer, which is designed to process solids. It's only a matter of time before they either uh, are thrown out or break uh, due to the weight of the, of the solids within them. The next the system that's out there is this, uh, is this below grade uh, separator with polishing uh, mesh adsorption packs. I only want to touch on this briefly because the below grade separators are largely used in the stormwater and petroleum market uh, industry, like the gas stations, that type of place, as well as the transportation industry. These systems have a corrugated plastic plate coalescer followed by secondary mesh absorption packs consisting of polypropylene monofilament fibers, which, which uh, attract oil. In theory, the coalescer should be the primary separation device, and these packs 
are supposed to allow the water to flow through and catch any of the small droplets and allow, allow them to coalesce into larger droplets and rise to the top. In most cases, the plate coalescers are designed with too little surface area for the flow rate and get inefficient oil separation, so the manufacturers add adsorption packs to improve the removal efficiency and meet effluent standards. Essentially, this equipment relies on these polishing mesh packs to make up for or to do the work that their primary coalescer should be doing. Their design philosophy is pretty simple. Uh, since we cannot meet 60 micron removal requirements with our separator at design maximum flows, we'll simply uh, insert these high surface area mesh packs in the back and cover ourselves. But as you can see from the pictures, they are prone to fouling and ripping and are difficult to maintain. Here's an important question to ask yourself before you either buy one of these or you start working on one. Uh, if if this were an effective design method to treat oily waste, why wouldn't every separator manufacturer simply fill the entire tank with mesh packs and leave out the primary coalescer? It would certainly be a lot cheaper. And the reason is because it would be one giant mess. The problem with many underground units are poorly engineered coalescers. And this is where you have to put your due diligence before you buy one of these systems. And the mesh packs, uh, that readily plug up and need, the, need frequent replacement are just a crutch. And that needs to be brought to the attention of the manufacturer before they build the system or before they design the system. So the last one, the last technology I'm, I'm going to talk about is this vertical tube coalescer, uh, the VTC technology. It's somewhat of a hybrid between a traditional coalescer and a secondary mesh pack. This design, it, it doesn't utilize Stokes' law. Rather, as the oil droplets drift by the polypropylene mesh tubes, they are attracted to the tubes by adsorption, very much the same way as the secondary mesh packs. In theory, these small modular VTC coalescer packs should collect droplets of oil and agglomerate them by coalescence into larger droplets that float up to the top, and the solids are supposed to simply fall down and out of the vertical tubes. In reality, the VTC coalescers are in a fixed matrix that is too tight. The openings for wastewater to flow is between one eighth and one quarter inch, which is way too small for typical industrial wastewater applications and is easily blinded by things like leaves and sticks and plastic and other solids that are more than an eighth of an inch or larger. It is true that the fixed uh, tight matrix does attract oil very well, but at the same time, the finer solids drift through the pack come into contact with the oil and simply cling to the oil particles, creating an oily sludge deep within the coalescer. As you can see uh, in the visuals that are on the screen, once plugged up, the packs are almost impossible to clean completely. Uh, I find that the VTC packs need replacement more often than other types of coalescers and become an ongoing maintenance and expensive replacement item. So to sum up, the technologies and my view of some of these technologies, I see very little technical progress since the flat plate coalescer improved the API separator. The plastic-based coalescers are cheap alternatives that have short lifespans, require high maintenance, and need replacement more often than metal plate coalescers. Uh, in my experience, I've only used and I only recommend the metal plate coalescers. And that brings me to, my, to the case study. This was a uh, study that we, this is a system that we built for a large uh, northeast utility and electric utility that would be, receive the cease and desist order from pumping out manholes. As some of you uh, may or may not realize, uh, in large cities there's, there's hundreds of thousands of manholes, electrical manholes, and you, once you have to go in, you have to do maintenance, you have to pump the water out first. It used to be that, that the utilities would simply pump them out to the, to the curb to the street. Uh, the cities, and many cities, are, are stopping this. And this utility, once they got their cease and desist, they had to put in a system to treat all this water. They came to us and uh, gave us some criteria that we had to meet. And uh, what we had was uh, an unusual problem because the water coming out of manholes contains hydrocarbons such as gasolines, transformer oils, lubricating oils, vegetable oils. You can't imagine how many restaurants 
or their grease pits uh, at night uh, down manholes, as well as um, suspended solids, dissolved solids, and in particular for the regulators, PCBs, arsenic, and lead. Uh, the flow rate was specified to be 30 gallons a minute max and designed to operate unmanned 24-7 with remote alarm modifications to resolve problems. The final design consisted of several 20,000 gallon baffled settling tanks, air-driven diaphragm pumps, as I said, we don't use centrifugal pumps in these applications, gross solids removal down to about a sixteenth of an inch, and then oil water separation, which consisted of a flat metal plate coalescer for oil and solids removal. That was followed up by fine solids removal to down to about five micron, and then we treated it with Mycelex polymeric surfactant technology for uh, PCB and fine emulsion removal. We ended up with uh, an absorptive technology uh, to remove lead and arsenic uh, before the city, before discharging to the city uh, source system. The results of the process, the influent oil concentrations range from 10 ppm to 1 percent, which would be about 10,000 ppm, oil and grease. The effluent was always less than LLD, which for this particular site was 5 ppm. I have to tell you that the oil water separator, with all the variable oils coming in, types of oils, concentrations of oils, we never got, we, we ranged between 5 and 8, and we never got over 8 ppm oil coming out of that separator, uh, which we found to be um, uh, outstanding. And we were at about a, about a, a two-month cleanup for the, for the separator, where we would pull it out and wash down the plates. So it was very, very effective. The PCB influence uh, ranged from less than LLD to about 100 ppb, and we consistently were less than 300 parts per trillion, which were their limits. Uh, we know that we can get to less than 65 parts per trillion for PCBs. Uh, the arsenic was coming in at LLD uh, up to as high as 112, and we were consistently less than the 4.5 ppb, which was the LLD for that particular method. So this is an example of how the oil water separator flat plate coalescer fit into a treatment process. The oil had to be removed before the dissolved solids could be treated. And the flat metal plate coalescer did an outstanding job. So I, I really want to give it some kudos. Without it, we couldn't have, uh, we couldn't have made this thing work. Now that we are familiar with um, what is being used in the field and the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it, uh, Dave Godding uh, will discuss uh, which design features uh, help with compliance. So Dave? Well, Phil, thank you so much for um, that uh, incredible overview. You had a lot of interest and a lot of questions came in, so stick around. We're going to have you back uh, to be part of the uh, Ask the Experts panel. Thank you so much, Phil. And now, as you mentioned, let's bring on Dave. And uh, Dave, could you spend just a moment to tell the audience on what your focus is going to be on, what topics and the key, uh, key messages you'll be covering? Uh, good, thank you, and uh, I appreciate everyone who's come on and listened to us today. We're going to talk about um, how, uh, what to look for in a coalescer. When you're looking at one, you're comparing this, uh, you're considering uh, various features and benefits of a coalescer, what to look for in order to meet compliance. What's going to meet compliance for long periods of time? How do you extend the time between maintenance? And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. That's what we're going to get into uh, as we go here. The first thing I want to do is I want to, um, you know, with, with what Phil talked about, I hope you got the idea that um, solids are the component that causes the issue in oil water separation. Now, it's oil water separation design, but it's not so much the oil that causes the problem with uh, meeting compliance. It's the solids, and if we deal with solids, we're going to have success in, in our separation. So uh, at Mercer, we've kind of developed a little formula, and we live by it as we uh, tweak our designs and do things. It's oil plus solids plus time. And the question is, what does that equal? And uh, we'll go on and we'll show you what that equals. It always equals sludge. Oil in the presence of solids over a certain amount of time always comes up with, the, with sludge. And uh, what we find out is that uh, Phil talked about these technologies. Some of the uh, pictures are shown. These technologies all work, and every one that was shown has a certain amount of high efficiency to them. The problem is they only work for short periods of time. 
So as you're considering coalescers, as you're considering what to do, uh, one thing we want you to be aware of is that a coalescer needs to process solids out of the pack. If it simply filters solids, uh, you have a problem. If it can process solids down and out of the pack, you're in good shape. So that's part of the key as you're looking around to figure out how do we extend time between maintenance? How do we keep our unit within the limits of our effluent uh, permits? Um, the other area that's often missed, and this is key, is how do you keep uh, oils and solids apart? Since they both create sludge over time, if we can keep them separate, I can show you in the next slide what we do a little different than some of these other ones. Um, you know, we build a versatile pack. On the left-hand side is a modern-day uh, flat plate design pack that Phil was talking about. We had, uh, early on, we had the ability to talk to uh, several people in the electric utility industry about what they liked on their separators, what they didn't like. They gave us the feedback, and almost invariably, you know, they said, look, it, it's the coalescer. Uh, they foul quickly. They, they don't process solids, and we can't keep in uh, compliance over this. So when we designed our system uh, a little more than 20 years ago, we found that this is what we keyed on. Uh, we keyed on long runs between maintenance. And we found that if we dealt with solids uh, and also kept the criteria for, uh, you know, down in that 60 micron range, we're going to be in good shape for long periods of time for our clients. So the first thing you're going to note is that this coalescer is shown here. This is an entry area view. We're a little higher so you can see some depth. Basically, this is an entry area view. So the flow is coming in this area right here. You'll notice flat plate design. It's a flat plate that goes all the way through the coalescer pack. Critical. And we're finding that this time-honored uh, flat plate design is something we've come full circle on. This was the original design concept. And the flat plate design at a 55 degree steep angle, that's where we are here. If you're in a 55 or 60 degree angle, you have a much better shot of solids falling down and out of the plate pack system. But the fact is that if we're steep and we have a flat plate design, there are no nooks and crannies. If you look at the other designs we looked at today, lots of nooks and crannies, lots of places for uh, the solids to lodge. You know, once solids lodge in a plate, they kind of grow off of each other and the fouling goes much more quickly. A cross flow design. In today's marketplace, all the real designers go with a cross flow design. Phil mentioned the upflows and the downflows. They're both counter current. Meaning one of, the, one of the components, like solids, has to fight against the flow of water. When it does that, it tends to ramp up and plug. So if you move this to a counter current design, like we have here, water's flowing here, and water flows through the separator all the way to the back end. Water, oil, and solids all are heading in the same general direction. With that, you can keep the plate gaps here much tighter without the same fouling. Uh, moving on to our next area, I think is important, is the herringbone design. There's several manufacturers in the industry that design a herringbone design. What do we mean that by that? We mean we take uh, the plates and we break them up into something like you'd see uh, on a herringbone uh, a jacket, where the plate widths are short. Instead of a plate width being up here and having to travel solids all the way down at the bottom out of the pack, six, seven, eight foot on a large unit, by breaking up the plate widths, now we only have to travel this far. On a Mercer design, that's 24 inches. So as you're looking at it throughout industry and you're comparing and contrasting and considering designs, look for a plate pack system with short plate widths. The short plate widths are uh, very important. It also gives you a, a, a tighter rise to run ratio, and that's important for solids. So instead of solids up here having to fall way down a plate, ramping up and plugging, now it only has to fall 24 inches. That's important. The other thing to look for uh, that we've incorporated is uh, to be able to process solids. Will your coalescer, the one that you have or the one that you're looking to get, does it, does it process solids? And we've incorporated chimney zones. So in between our uh, plate widths, our herringbone design, we've incorporated uh, dedicated zero-velocity areas. And what I mean by dedicated is, is we have one dedicated for 
solids, one for oils, solids, oils, and solids. Remember, oils and solids over time create sludge. So what we want to do is separate them. So in this case, solids will fall down plates here, plates here, and they will hit a dedicated chimney zone. This, as soon as a solid falls out, can take all the time it wants to fall out. Uh, kind of a neat concept. And by doing this, by being able to process solids down and out, you're going to extend the time between cleanings and, and you're actually going to stay in compliance much longer. On our, on our next slide, we'll see that um, a different view. Here's the coalescer. It's a nice four inch deep. And here you can see this chimney zone goes the full width the full flow direction of the coalescer. The plates are in place here, solids fall out, drop out. This particular one, by the way, is a three foot by about four foot. This will process about 100 gallons per minute. Now on this side, this is the flow through this set of plates and through this set of plates. The solids will fall down in both directions, hit the chimney zone. So this is a good shot of one part of the chimney zone here. The baffles here and here keep the flow out of this area. So as soon as solids fall out, um, they'll take their time and can be processed out of the pack. On the next slide, you'll see uh, the same thing. It's a herringbone design. In fact, we saw the slide earlier. Not only is this manufacturer got a herringbone design, which is better, it's cross flow. That's better too. Part of the issues here, again, is, are the nooks and crannies that they have here. The nooks and crannies create all kinds of problems. But let's say the solids do make their way down here and down here. They dead end, especially on the larger units, anything 500 GPM and above. They're stacking these things side to side and top to bottom. And when they stack this bundle and this bundle together in their herringbone design, there's a dead end here. So if solids do make it down here, the, the solids grow back. The bigger the unit, the bigger the problem with solids. Okay, and as we go on, we'll see the difference between uh, a herringbone design with and without uh, an area for solids. Here, two bundles together, and what's happening is the weight of the solids that have built up eventually overtake and collapse the packs. Uh, the packs are not inexpensive. And what will happen is um, as the solids build up, they sit, and finally you'll see what's happened here. With a big chimney zone like we have here, maybe we should call it a beefy zone instead of a, a chimney zone because it's just big. It's almost impossible to foul. Uh, I've, I've been looking at these things in the field for many, many years, and I have not seen one fouled yet. That's how, that's how big the chimney is on here. And that's important because if you can process solids, you're in good shape. Um, the next thing we want to talk about, and this is often overlooked, is um, the ease of cleaning. If you find a coalescer that's easy to clean, you're in good shape. And one thing you can do to kind of feel out, well, will it be easy to clean? Uh, will the solids process out? Imagine having a nice, clean, brand new coalescer in front of you. Imagine the one you're either using or the one you're planning to buy. And, and imagine having a big, two-fisted handful of like a, a, a coarse sand. Throw that into the coalescer, you know, in the entry area or throw it in uh, on the top. What's going to happen to that sand? If, you know, 20 or 25 percent of that sand doesn't find its way falling out of the coalescer, that's a problem. So as you're comparing contrasting, considering various designs for your next application or for upgrading what you have. I'll tell you, that's a good one. If you were to put sand in there, is the sand going, are the sand particles going to find their way out? If they are, you got a good design. If they're not, you have a problem. Ease of cleaning. If you're able to clean the pack all the way through, you've got a good design. If you can't, I think you're in a little trouble. Here's a picture of a guy in the entry area of the coalescer. The maintenance guy is cleaning up, and the next slide shows what a cross-flow, flat plate, short width design with chimney zones does. He is a, a five-foot distance here, and there's still velocity coming through there. We can clean from this part of the separator, from this part. We can clean from this part of the coalescer. We can clean from the back of the coalescer. All these areas to clean. Not only that, but as the water comes in, it flushes down, hits the chimney zone, and out. Kind of a, a, an interesting thing. Now, if you can't clean 
your coalescer completely, what happens is the inside doesn't get cleaned out. You saw some photos from before. So the moment you put it back in for work, you've already have a re reduced performance and there's immediate reduction in performance and the ability to pull out oils. Not only that, but you, uh, you're handicapping yourself on how long you can extend your cleaning. All right, moving on, um, we build the stainless steel packs. A nice stainless steel pack, they, um, they have a, a, a smooth, flat, hard plate that stays good for years. That's important for moving and, and processing solids as opposed to some uh, plates that'll sag or corrode or things like that. I love the stainless steel feature. We use these in the oil and gas, the electric utility, the petrochemical. These are the things that are going to last for years and years, not needing a replacement. And um, finally, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, versatility. You got to pick a coalescer system that's going to be versatile. Here's our standard design. We ship these out with every other plate in place. It is a one inch gap and it's an adjustable plate gap system in which if we want a less uh, a maintenance uh, routine, if you can't put the maintenance into it that's required, if you need to bump that out, we build the coalescer a little bigger and, and maybe go in with the two inch plate gap instead of a standard one inch. If you're at a two inch plate gap and you decide you need tighter plates in the field, you can simply slide the plates in, done. Back to 60 micron removal, which is great. Now, we do know that there are times where the wastewater characteristics will change, flow rates are going to inc increase, oil contents higher, or if effluent regulations change, you know, if you're down to 5 ppm, and believe me, uh, it's, it's coming. We're shipping things overseas where the requirement's five parts per million now. They realize that the environmental thing's here to stay and they're taking care of that. So in this case, we're able to get down to a half inch, which is a 5 16th right angle gap, and bring it down into that 45 micron removal. That's about as uh, a tight as you get in the, in the industry. Also, the plates are completely removable, so if there's any real burdensome, sticky, stubborn solids, you can take the plate out and clean it right up. On the next slide, you'll, so, you'll see a typical maybe 600 GPM coalescer. Here's one with our standard plates in place. Every other plate. With every other plate in place, we've got a one inch gap, real high efficiency. Uh, this is an all stainless steel pack. This one's used in about 180 degree Fahrenheit. Um, years later, still looking really good. With, with every plate in place, 45 micron removal, we're about in the highest efficiency available in the industry. Now, that's with a cross flow design, chimney zones, flat plate. Uh, these things can go a quarter, six months without fouling. Uh, real good. And um, the next slide shows a client who said, look, we can't put the time into maintenance. We only want to maintain this stuff every couple of years. So what we did was we grew the coalescer a little bit and put in every fourth plate. Actually, it was, it was actually more than that, and we ended up getting a four-inch plate gap out of this thing. So what they got was they got an oversized coalescer so that we could still give them the efficiency they needed to get down into low PPM range. We were able to give them low maintenance, so every couple of years they could pull this thing out and was still operating. And there's room for versatility. So in the future, if anything changed, they're in good shape. I, I know my time's up. I would like to go over one more slide. It's kind of a next generation innovation. And this is a, uh, a staggered plate design we've been working on. And as, uh, as solids are in the wastewater and they've got to get down to these five part per million uh, things, what we do is we stagger the plates. So the front end of the plate near the entry we may have a couple of inches, a couple inch gap. This is to take care of a lot of the solids so that as we go into the tighter plate gaps here getting 60 micron, we've taken out a bunch of the solids that the upfront empty container won't take care of. In this area then, we can run longer because this took out some of the solids that would have plugged this area. And we can actually, in our bigger coalescers, put the tightest plate gaps over here. By doing that, um, we can really uh, squeeze out the most from a, a coalescer system. As the uh, oil and grease limits get stricter, this is going to become more and more interesting. We built a few of these and have very good, uh, we've had very good um, performance out of that. 
And the last slide, just as a quick overview, we build above ground, below ground rectangular retrofit rentals. And we do an awful lot of custom design and um, interested to hopefully see some applications that you may have. Mike? Thank you, Dave. Excellent. Excellent. Folks, uh, we're going to get to your questions in just a moment. But as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, we have a couple of polls. And now we'd like to ask you, what effective compliance strategies do you think are the most important based upon what you heard today? Is it flat plate design? Would it be short plate width, herringbone design, uh, adjustability for plate gap, or solid settling zones? And let's share the results. And as you can see, uh, in order, 38% believe flat plate design, 18% short plate width, 30% herringbone design, 50% adjustability for plate gap, and 60% solid settling zones. Dave, I hear you uh, humming in the background. What's your thoughts on this? Um, <clears throat> interesting that the um, uh, adjustable plate gap is at 50% because uh, at the moment we're, we're the only ones doing it. And it is a, it's a good future thing. You can, you can design a unit and then later, if there's a change or another need, you can add it without having to change out the whole coalescer separator. The solid, the solid settling zones, that's great to see 60%. Again, I don't know anyone who's doing that kind of a thing, uh, but it's true. If you can process solids out, you're in much better shape than just having a coalescer that acts as a, a filter instead of a coalescer. Well, thanks. And Phil, let me uh, bring you back to the virtual podium. And uh, if you'd like to take a moment to weigh in and share your observations on this poll, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, probably all that's been said that can be said about it. But the it's interesting that the solid settling zone because this is a, this is clearly the area where where they have the most uh, visible problems. This is what they has to be cleaned up. This is what's most difficult to clean up. And it's um, it's interesting that it, that it's affecting the strategy, the compliance strategies, uh, the most. Well, thanks. So hold on there a second, Phil and uh, Dave. I want to give you a couple moments to share with the audience some tips and ideas on how they can get started. So if you wouldn't mind covering off on these, we'll uh, we'll get back to the questions in just a moment. So Dave, okay. if you want to take this one here. Yeah. I'm taking a look at that, starting uh, next steps. What you do on your next step as you're looking for, um, you have an existing step or you want to know what to do. Find out where you are with the effluent compliance. Uh, where, you know, go, go to your effluent guy and find out, are you in compliance? Are you in compliance to the point where you're satisfied with it? If your equipment's uh, continually uh, missing and creating problems, then you don't want to look into something else. If you're in good shape, then, you're, then, then that's fine. You want to check the physical condition of your coalescer. A lot of the photos we had, uh, you know, with the solids and the lack of uh, maintenance, or there could be plenty of maintenance, but the solids are enough there. They break. The solids build up. They stress the plates. There are a lot of cracked and broken plates. You want to get in it and see if your coalescer is physically in good shape. If it's not, that's going to create you problems with your effluent because there'll be areas for the uh, water to short circuit. Um, uh, obvious one, maybe, is check the physical tank. If the tank that's housing the uh, coalescer is uh, going, going, gone due to corrosion. It may be time to replace it. Um, these kind of tanks will last anywhere from, it depends on the corrosion level of wastewater, but uh, ten, 10 years to 15 is about, yet. We have units out there, um, you know, 20 years in service, but it really depends how well the client takes care of it. And if there's a lot of pox and, and uh, corrosion going on to the point where it's time to replace it, that's a good time to also look at what kind of coalescer system you're using. And the other big one that you should be doing if you haven't uh, done it already is really determine what the actual cost is of your separator. Um, for instance, how much labor time per year are you putting in? Uh, a lot of these coalescer systems, they foul up, they're hard to clean, and after a couple of three cleanings, they're being tossed away, new spare parts in. 
they're very expensive. Even though they're plastic, it's a replacement part, and the, uh, the markers on there are quite expensive. So that's another area. If you're finding that in a year you're spending $10,000, dollars 40000 on maintenance when you don't have to, it's time to start looking and saying what else is out there. Thanks, Dave. Well, let's get going, and I, I think you both have done a great job of covering what we set out to do, and hopefully, folks, we, we've given you what you need to know on some of the things to prevent your company from incurring citations and fines, and uh, certainly Dave has given you some ideas on how you can increase the uh, time between maintenance cleaning schedules and ultimately save your company money. So let's get to the questions, and uh, I'm now going to uh, call back Phil and Dave, and uh, Dave, here's the first question uh, from our audience. Uh, why are the plastic coalescers used still if they foul and break so often? You want to take that? Mm, yeah, why are they fouled if they break so often? <clears throat> or why are they used? Yes. Why are they used if That's they still question. foul and I, break I, so often, right? Yeah. What I would say is um, the, the plastic corrugated... Um, uh, coalescers out there overtook the market several years ago. It was a price thing, and there was a big price war, and how do we build uh, a unit for less money? And so they've become basically the status quo, and people who have them generally don't know their other options. And what happens is they fail, they fail, they fail, they figure out what to do. They put something good in, and they're like, oh, look, there's something else. So I think it's a, it's a lack of knowledge of what's available in the, in the marketplace. Great. Uh, let me toss another one your way. Uh, Dave, do I have to replace my entire separator? Can I put your packs inside something I already have? Oh, yeah, definitely. That's what we uh, call an existing system retrofit. We do quite a lot of that where the, the first thing is, remember I said you got to take, uh, you know, you got to inspect your tank. If your tank's in really bad shape, you might not want to do that, but if your, your separator tank, your steel's in good shape, and it's got a good shape for separation, typically rectangular of some sort, we've done a lot of that where we pull out the guts and we replace it with good flow distribution, inlet and outlet side, and coalescers. And we've, uh, we've had some really good success there. We've also done the same thing with API units, the empty tanks where we simply insert our coalescers, some automatic stimming, some flow distribution, and it's had some really good results. Great. Phil, here's one for you. Uh, you had mentioned in your case study about a filtration product that was used. Can you give a little more detail on that? Yeah, there's, there, in that case study there were several filtration uh, steps. Uh, before the oil water separator, there was about a sixteenth inch uh, basket to pick up really the big the big stuff coming through. Then we had the solids removal within the oil water separator and the flat plate coalescer, which took out quite a bit of the of the oily sol solids uh, settled to the bottom. From there, we went into five micron uh, bag filters. Actually, we used twenty five micron uh, double layered bags. Before we went through five, or before we went through uh, five micron. Mycelex cartridges. Uh, this Mycelex technology is a uh, um, it's a polymeric surfactant. It's a combination of uh, a drying oil and methacrylate that's applied to a surface and makes an extremely hydrophobic filter um, to the point where we can pull out the PCBs and pull out the oils down to less than detectable levels. After that, we went through uh, carbon pressed carbon cartridges for the lead removal with with very specific carbon. Uh, carbon that was uh, designed to remove lead. And after that, we removed the arsenic on uh, ion exchange resin that was impregnated with iron. Uh, this turned out to be, this was a new technology at the time, and it turned out to be extremely effective. So that's, uh, that's pretty much the, uh, the, the whole system. It, it, it was a combination of uh, oil, oil water separation and filtration at almost every stage. Okay. Thanks. Uh Dave, I don't know if this would be for it'd probably be for you or Phil, but do you uh, do you do large flow applications for stormwater? Do we do large flow? So, well, let's see. We can build a unit uh, about as uh, as large as we can ship. Uh, our largest units to date have been uh, about seventy foot long. Uh, the limitations mostly are in width 
and height for shipping. And in that case, uh, we've done some uh, field erected units where the, the end user uh, builds the unit on site and we ship the internals. Yeah, so yes, um, you know, we built some uh, 5,000 uh, GPM separators for stormwater. Well, speaking of applications, here's another question. I'm sure this is um, something you can answer, Dave. What industry segments do you find use your equipment the most, and, and why would you say? Generally, uh, in, generally, industry can use our units, but for whatever reason, we've been uh, real successful in the transportation industry. The electric utility industry is being very big for us. Some oil and gas, chemical and petrochemical. These uh, these industries uh, they have got some pretty nasty wastewater, and we've done really well with them because I think we handle solids well. By handling solids well, we um, we we meet their needs. They call us back once we put one in. Terrific. Well, you'll love this question, um, and it says. I like this. The million dollar question about your design, is it going to cost me a million dollars? Is that for me? Yes, that would be for you. Oh. Uh, yes, it'll cost you a million dollars. Now, our equipment costs more. It does. There's not a question about it. It costs a little more to build. It costs more to fabricate. There's much more to it. It's a labor-intensive uh, fabrication. But I, I think it's important to note that it's not just the initial uh, purchase that counts for a company. They're going to have this thing for 15 years or, or more. They take care of it. And they have 15 years of you know, quarterly or, or semi-annual cleanings or, or tough applications monthly. And they have to deal with the cost of the labor for cleaning. They have to deal with the trucks, the back trucks, uh, and the hauling. And it gets, it, it's very expensive. So the life cycle of the equipment makes ours really the best purchase as, as you look uh, at uh, you know 15 years of operating. After, after two or three, four years, we've paid for ourselves and the rest is just an increase for the client. Less headaches for them, they can sleep at night too knowing the equipment's going to work. Great. Well folks, uh, we're getting close to uh, the end of our session and before I give you some final housekeeping information, Phil and Dave, I'd like to ask if you have some thoughts or closing comments you'd like to leave with the audience. Phil, let's start with you first, and then Dave, and then we'll give the folks some information on how they can get a copy of the recording. Yeah, Mike, I, I've got two things that, that I'd just like to leave them with. And, and one is that before you buy a system, make sure that you're specifying the system and you're purchasing it. Make sure you're not sold a system. It makes a huge difference. And if you have a system, Routine maintenance is extremely important. What we see is that people say, it's clean, oh, it's dirty. It's clean, no, it's dirty. And they keep going between, on the sinusoidal wave with, with, with sharp peaks. What they need to do is once it's clean, they need to keep cleaning it on a daily basis or on a routine basis. And if they do that, they don't get to the point where it's ever completely dirty and, uh, and damaging the system or shutting down or, or taking them out of compliance. So that's what I just like the final thoughts I'd like to leave you with. Thanks, Phil. Dave? Yeah, that's a good point, Phil. Um, I see a lot of clients, uh, what they do is they put their separator they, you know, in, they run it until they're having effluent problems. They say, we better, we better take a look at that. You're right. If you set up a regimen of cleaning, what you do is uh, you slowly learn how often you have to clean your separator, you know, whether it's once a month, once a quarter, once a year. You get to know the application. And what we like to do is supply high efficiency uh, separator systems that are going to take long runs. And uh, there's nothing better for me than to replace a unit that's not been doing well. You know, got it and put in our internals and then have it perform very well and, and actually they can go twice as long, maybe even three times as long before they have to maintain it. I get a, a pride out of supplying a client that kind of uh, equipment. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Phil. And, and folks in the audience, as, as I said at, also at the top of the webinar, we really value your time and appreciate you joining us. And we're just about at the top of the hour, or the end of the hour, I should say. So thanks again to, to Phil and Dave uh, for their great insight and, of course, for, for Mercer International for making uh, this terrific session available. 
And uh, always special thanks to our logistics producer, uh, Patty Van Hooser, for all of her help behind the scenes and collaboration in making this come together. And most importantly, thanks again for joining us. And as your moderator, this is Mike Agron saying, have a great day and a great rest of the week, and bye for now.